You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Who Did What Now, the history podcast that's not your history class, Betty Sodes. The little bits of history that don't quite fit in it anywhere else. With me, your host, Katie Charlwood, history harlot and reader of books. Well, it's been an interesting couple of days. Ireland got knocked out of the Eurovision, but that's because the song wasn't really anything. Like, it wasn't great. It was fine. Like, it was a fine song, but it wasn't anything exciting. See, the way I see it is, if you're going to do Eurovision, right, what you need to do is get loudy. You have to go for it. You want to do a ballad, make it a proper ballad. Make it really sad, really lean into it, right? Or make it really empowering. But if you're going to go, like, poppy or rocky, like, you have to go full pop, full rock. And it should be fun. I love it when there's something, like, silly and fun uh, or exciting and weird and wacky. What my mum calls me. Um, she's like, you're going to love this. It's Portugal. And I'm like, is she weird? Which is my automatic response. And I turn around and she's wearing an entire skirt made out of feathers. Red feathers. And I'm like, I could make that outfit. I could wear that outfit. Because that's who I am as a person. I, I watch Eurovision and go, I could get away with that outfit because of who I am as a person. That's that's just me though. Uh, I'm a Eurovision fan. I I didn't like it for years because it got really serious. I don't need Eurovision to be serious. I need Eurovision to be a bubble. You know, it should be you know a good time. Because if it's not, what the hell are you doing? But I don't know what you're thinking. You're thinking, quit your chipper chopper and fact me. In fact, you I will. But first, a disclaimer. I have a habit of speaking, well, on this, the way that I speak normally. So there will be swear words, expletives, cursing, and if that isn't your jam, I suggest you go somewhere else for your history lesson because I'm going to talk the way I talk, I swear like a sailor, and if you find that offensive or rude or unpleasant, then you might want to get the fuck out. That being said, let me tell you, about sex workers, the American colonies, and the rise of the millionaire. See, it all starts in pre-revolutionary France, all the way back to the 1700s. King Louis the Fourteenth, he's dead. We shame. Rest his soul and whatnot. Sorrows, sorrows, prayers. So he's, you know, in the dirt. And... The next king, the other Louis, so many Louis, just one after the other, consistently in a row. So yeah, Louis the Fifteenth, he is too young to rule. So the Duke of Orleans, his uncle, Philippe, he is ruling in his stead. So he's the acting regent, right? And he has a money man because Louis the Fourteenth you know, very popular man, popular leader, however, was absolutely shit stupid with money, consistently waging wars, just, oh man, the country, France, it is in debt, it's in bucket loads of debt, it's up to its eyeballs, you know, the economy is completely stagnant at this point because they don't have really anything going on, right? And they don't even have a reserve. So like, you know, you hear about gold reserve and stuff like that. So like precious metals, gold, silver and the like, normally this would be used as sort of a backup for the currency, you know? Or the currency would be gold, silver and whatnot. Ducats. Ah, uh, not, not so, not so. Things weren't going well. So John Law is the Scottish economist. I know, right? Are you going to tell me a story about a Scottish economist? That sounds very interesting, Katie. Thanks. This is whew, really exciting me with this. Bear with me, okay? Trust the process. 
John Law, he arrives in France a couple months later. King Louis the Fourteenth croaks it, right? Leaves the country in a, you know, just a shit storm. It's up creek without a paddle, you know what I mean? And so the Duke of Orleans, he's ruling and he needs to get money and they need to make it fast. And lucky for them, John Law, pretty good with numbers, pretty good with money. Also a bit of a gambler, likes to take a risk. Literally and figuratively. So he would not be allowed in a casino today because he counts cards. He's a mathematician. He's, like I said, really fucking good with numbers. So he uses his math mind and his economist mind and is a sneaky little bastard. And he comes up with an idea. And so, again, he is the money man. So he's the money man for the Duke of Orleans. And he gets put in charge of the Bank General Privé, the private general bank. I say he gets put in charge of, really he's kind of the only man for the job because he comes up with the idea of this private general bank. Now the purpose of this bank is to create paper money. Because remember, pre this, they're all dealing with coins and jewels and other such luxuries. And so the Bank General is created so that they can produce money. And it's one of like six banks that actually has paper money. I think there's, uh, was it England, Venice, Genoa, and I think one in Sweden, maybe? Is that six? I don't know. Well, it's one of six anyway. There's Holland? Yeah, cause it's in Holland. And yes, I mean the region of Holland and not the country of the Netherlands. Holland, Friesland, etc. But yeah, so they've done that. So this is created to fight the national debt. So the paper is credit. So people could invest in the bank and some of the money would go into like making paper money and some of it would go into like these government bonds, which were kind of useless. But anyway, people purchase stock, the stock invested in other things, blah, 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 boring business stuff. Now, and this leads to him basically chasing these monopoly companies, right? And so these are companies that rule the entirety of all of these areas. So France bankrolls these monopoly companies and, you know, it offers them stock. Again, boring business stuff. Now, uh, Philippe, the Duke of Orleans, he ends up putting law as the dude in charge. Do you know the money man? The money man. The money man. Yes. The controller general. Yeah, so he's the controller general of finances and he has so much power and control. So he's in charge of just... Oh, how do I put this? Every fucking thing. Every bloody thing. He's in charge of it. Money coming in, money going out. Internal revenue, external revenue. Giving him control over money law. Money law, law is about money. Income, expenditure. And this leads to like a bunch of reforms. So he creates the Mississippi Company, which changes, you know, a name later on. The Mississippi Company is actually a consolidation. It's all of the sort of trading companies in Louisiana. They're all smushed together to come under one monopoly, right? So it's just... One company in charge of all that. So he's over in Louisiana. Well, he's not, but the company is. And he's out hobnobbing with the rich and the fancy. You know, all of the well-to-dos in French society. And he starts convincing them that Louisiana is going to make them so much money. They're going to be drowning in money. They're going to be so rich. And um, they buy it. Literally. So... Everybody, everybody is desperate to get their claws into the Mississippi company. They all want a piece of this Mississippi pie. I regret nothing. Oh my god, the Mississippi mud pie. Oh, yeah. Sounds good, doesn't it? Anyway. So, people are investing it and the share prices, they are going through the roof. And so he has people like just printing off money. They're just printing and printing and printing. And... So there's more paper money than there is, like gold and silver, all of the l'argent. 
And the shares, well, they're so popular that they are selling out. And so the public, they're all buying shares from each other. They're trying to get their hands on it and they're doing it with paper money. So the more money they spend, the more money gets printed. You see, it's just like an Ouroboros, just... So this leads us to the Rue Quinsempois. I have probably mispronounced it, but I did my best. So it's this street in Marais and it's a wee street, it's a tiny wee street, and shares are being traded outside of the Mississippi the the Mississippi Company's offices. And this is an ancient street. Money lenders have been here, you know, for centuries. And it is absolute chaos. It is pandemonium, right? So you've got traders out in the street all hours of the night and day and some people actually get jobs as writing desks. So they would stand outside and they would use their backs. People would lean on their backs to like sign things and sell things. Like that is, I mean, that's, that's extreme, right? So it becomes just wild. Uh, but that's, again, part of the story. So like, they end up building these gates, like, either side, so that people could watch, just, like, people trade stocks, effectively. Like, the, it was entertainment. I mean, yeah, it's, it's wild. So back to Louisiana. They think Louisiana's going to be making the most money. But there's not that many French people in Louisiana. So, like, the French colony, it is also wee. It's tiny. There's just, like, 700 European colonists there in total. And it's an, it, it's a bog. It's swamp. Like, it's not developed. They've got nothing there. And there's... It's, it's not the most um, fruitful of endeavours. But John Law, he is desperate to get more people there. He's, you know, he's trying to get, you know, more money, you know, for France. And so he tries to, you know, sell it as like, you know, there's gold as far as the eye can see. It is a bountiful land. I mean, it is pretty bountiful if you know what you're looking for. But he's just trying to sell people to go there. But it's, it's not everybody's, you know, cup of tea. They're not heading out there. It's not really working for him. So he needs to get people in this colony. And so he turns to prisons. He he goes for what is effectively like the black sheep of society. So he goes to, um, he looks for criminals. He looks for sex workers. He looks for, well, anybody and everybody, people that he can force to go there. So at one point, he's actually raiding, or he's getting people to raid for him. He's not doing it himself. He's not doing the dirty work. He has hospitals raided because he's looking for, you know, the abject poor. He's looking for, and I quote, drunks and disorderly soldiers. And of course, he heads to the jails. So he goes to the prisons and he makes, you know, the people locked up in dungeons. I mean, it's not quite a dungeon, but like, it's not exactly pleasant, is it? So he goes in and he makes them an offer that they really don't have a chance to, you know, refuse. So he goes to the criminals and he goes, hey, do you want to stay in jail or... Do you want to marry a prostitute and sail to Louisiana? And so, like, for a lot of people, they're like, okay, so I get married and I have freedom and I get to escape horrifically poor France, where I have very little options or opportunities. And so they say, yeah, absolutely, let's do this. See, this works for him as well because he's also seen as cleaning up France, you know. But it's not exactly a honeymoon for those who decide to go. Because 
they don't just get sent on a ship. They don't have luxuries of any kind, unlike, you know, the previous settlers. I say settlers. Colonizers. When they head off, they have, you know, they have money. They have backing. They have options. And these, the man and wife, they are quite literally shackled together. So they are chained together, taken from the jail, and then forced to board a ship. And it's not exactly a comfortable journey they're cramped in. And after being stuck on a cramped, dirty, you know, disease-ridden ship for several weeks and they finally land in, you know, America. Well, uh, this is going to shock you, um, but they were less than welcomed. Because see, the people who were already in the colonies, they were seen as at least a little bit respectable. You know, they weren't exactly, you know, the dregs of society. And so they say these people come and they're like, fuck this, we're a game of soldiers. And they start moving. So they leave and they start heading to New Orleans because they absolutely want to get the hell out of Dodge. They want to get away from, you know, these people that they see as undesirables. Like they are just not in it, not happy. Uh Uh-uh. So first the, you know, the respectables, they bugger off, right? Because, you know, they feel like their, their camp's been invaded. And then the criminals, you know, the ex-soldiers, the sex workers, they are all just, uh, you know, left to their own devices. Things are going well and they are hungry. And so they end up deciding this ain't worth it and they leave too. So they end up moving to the more populated areas, right? And this is when Native Americans actually start reclaiming the territory. It also helps that they're actually used to it and they know the land almost as if they've been there their entire fucking lives. Oh, quelle surprise. And John Law, he is desperately trying to prove that, you know, this whole Louisiana situation, the Mississippi bubble, right? That it's profitable, that things are going well. And it's like they are forging paperwork and they're just like printing off more paper notes to like investors. And they're printing off so much money that some people are earning what they believe to be millions of francs in paper money, you know, which leads to millionaire, the creation of the millionaire. Now, unfortunately, this bubble is about to bust because word gets back, right, that things are not going as well in Louisiana as they have been, you know, previously informed. And luckily, like, there's uh, one prince actually heard before everyone else and managed to like cash in and takes the majority of the gold out of the bank before he saunters off. However, people are pissed, right? So there isn't enough gold and silver to back up all these notes because there's only like, like a fifth of it really to cover it. A fourth or a fifth is not a great amount. And um, it doesn't help why this prince is buggered off with three wagons of gold, like. And so, word is out, people are panicking. And so they are desperate to try and, like, switch the notes back to gold. And so these royal edicts are being pushed out that, you know, you know they're trying to be like, oh, gold isn't worth things, there's no point buying gold because it's devalued. And then, you know, they make printing money illegal and selling gold is always so illegal, so they can't, they can't switch and swap. And like it's not happening. The bank then inevitably collapses, and what was it the paper money? It's what like half the value it says on it. It's just completely whew, cut down the middle, and um, it, it it just it's pure unadulterated chaos. It's absolute madness, right? And like. At one point, you know, the, you know, it flips around and it makes gold legal again. And this causes an actual stampede. So people are, you know, they're desperate and they are, you know, 
trying to like exchange, you know, with all this paper for gold. And 17 people get crushed to death in a stampede in like a few minutes. And this leads to more anger and, um, mm, mm. needless to say, this is still fresh in many minds. And we all know what's coming for France after this. So John Law, naturally, gets, you know, the brunt of the blame for this, mainly because he was the main man behind it. So we're not really surprised. So there's this massive financial panic in France. People are freaking out. They're baying for blood. And he has to literally flee. So he escapes Paris, but he has to do so disguised as a woman. You know what's really funny is like he saved his life by being in drag. And also, funny because last week's um, Betty Sword also involved dressing up in disguises. I didn't even make that connection until right now. So yeah, he just goes. He's out and he never goes back to France again. You know, probably because he likes, you know, being alive. So he ends up having to go away from the Place Vendôme and his, you know, 21 other castles. 21 chateaux, 21 chateaux. Imagine having 21 chateaux. Ah, oh, c'est incredible. But he had, he was clearly doing well because he had 21 fucking castles. 21 castles. I just want one. Ah, oh, bloody love a wee castle. But anyway, he ends up buggering off to Italy, where he gambles the rest of his life before dying of pneumonia. But yes, that is the story of sex worker brides, the rise of the millionaire, and, you know, just chaos in France. Just chaos. Now, if you liked this retelling, um, feel free to rate and review five stars on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You don't even have to say nice things. I mean, I'd like you to say nice things, obviously, because I am a delight. But you don't have to. I mean, I'd like it if you did, but you don't have to. You can just say anything. You can tell me your favourite pyjamas. If you wear pyjamas. No, that's made it weird. That did make it weird, didn't it? But yeah, you can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, TikTok, I'm I'm kind of more active on Instagram, so if you want to, you know, follow me there, that would be super. And if you interact with me, I generally interact back, I- at least when I'm in a good mood. Um, I do try. And I wonder if there was anything else I had to say to you today. I feel like there was something important, but I genuinely don't remember what that was. But I did think it was a good idea for us to talk about something that wasn't, you know, murder for a week. <laughs> Especially considering we still have Mary Jane Kelly to go. That's next week's episode. And hopefully you are all ready for that one. Oh, and in less than two weeks, in less than a fortnight, I am going to be in Kansas. Am I? No, actually, I will literally be arriving in Kansas actually right now. So that's going to be fun. That's exciting. I'm going to be in Kansas. Oh, wow, for the Heartland Pagan Festival. If you haven't booked your tickets, book your tickets. There's a link in the description down below. And I am very excited. I've never been to the States before. This is well good. And my friends and I, we have a deal. I have to try and find the tackiest souvenir. Now, it has to be able to go in my suitcase, so it can't be, like, massive. So that's going to be fun. But yeah, I will uh, chat to you next time. This has been fun. Adios, au revoir, au revoir, my friends. Bye-bye.